For this lecture, we're going to look at how relative prices sends price signals to producers and how that affects the allocation of resources. The allocation of resources. So before we go into this concept of relative prices and how producers use relative prices as price signals um, to allocate their resources, we're going to uh, redefine what relative prices actually is. So relative prices, let's look at the formal definition again and remind ourselves of what this means. So relative prices is the price of one good or service relative or compared to another. And this means we're not talking about absolute prices. So we're not talking about, say, for the for, for example, a car or a house. We're not talking about a car which is worth $50,000 and a house which is worth $500,000. That the house is more expensive than the car, but we're talking about the relative price of a house to a car. So this means that if the car de decreases to $40,000, but this house unrealistically decreases, it depreciates to $200,000, we're going to see that the house is now relatively cheaper in terms of its price than it was before. So this is relative price, so the price of one good relative or compared to another. So we talk about this in ratio form. So here we have uh, cars 1 to 10, and now it becomes 1 to 5. So the, so the car has now become relatively cheaper. So now we're going to talk about how relative prices affect the allocation of resources. And the preconditions for which this to exist are that there are many buyers and sellers. Buyers are rational. And this means that they look for the cheapest price or they look for the cheapest alternative so that they minimize opportunity costs. Sellers will seek to maximize their profits and resources are interchangeable. And so this basically summarizes the conditions or four of the main conditions of a perfect perfectly competitive market. So when I when I talk about when resources are interchangeable, I mean that if a certain producer at the moment produces cars, they will be easily able to utilize the same resources and produce houses if the relative price of a house becomes more um, more expensive. So now let's look at demand and supply analysis of how relative prices actually send price signals to consumers or, and to producers and how they reallocate goods and services. Okay, so let's look at the example of Nokia. Now we know that Nokia before they were a paper company. And this may be obscure to some people, but before Nokia was a world-renowned telecommunications giant, they produced paper. They were a paper mill and a pulp. They were pulp farming. Telecommunications giant. At the moment they're a telecommunications giant. So what happened was before we had the market for paper, and we also had a market for phones. So using the same demand and supply analysis that we have been talking about throughout these um, series of lectures on microeconomic demand, we have a upward sloping supply and a down sloping demand. So let's say initially the equilibrium price of a paper was somewhere at P1 and the equilibrium quantity traded was at Q1. And so what happens is that for whatever reason the demand for paper goes down. And so we should see a shift in the demand curve for paper from D0 to D1. Oh, let's make that clearer in terms of the, the graphs and let's call that D D1 and D2. Okay. So now, as you can see, using simple demand and supply analysis, we're going to reach a new equilibrium point at P2 and Q2. 
And what this means is that the price of paper, the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity traded has decreased. And so because Nokia can utilize their labor, capital and land resources in either the production of phones or paper, now they see that the, because the relative price of phones is, has now become more expensive compared to paper, so because the relative price of phones has increased, this will mean that this, um, this change in price of paper would then send price signals to producers, so to Nokia, so that they should reallocate their resources to their most effective use. So what happens here is because there is now a contraction in supply, because now that at point P2, or initially at point P1, sorry, initially at point P1, there is now a surplus in supply, because demand is at, at this point here, supply is at this point here. So what this means is they have to decrease supply. So they're contracting the supply, and at the same time, demand is expanding. And so they reach this new equilibrium point. But because Nokia aims to maximize profits, as all rational businesses do, and because they can easily reallocate their resources to a more productive use in selling phones, they, they can see a fewer profit opportunities in the market for paper because the price is lower now. So what this means is they're going to allocate more resources to, to phones. So they're going to allocate resources to the production of phones. And this would actually increase the supply of phones to S2 and therefore at the same time increase the production of phones from Q1 to Q2. And so that's how um, relative prices and price signals work. So to recap, what happens here is, let's recap this whole model again. Relative prices are the price of one good and compared to another. So if, you, if the price of one good, so let's look at the steps one by one. So if the price of one good increases relative, this is very important, the relative part. So it's not absolute prices, it's the relative price. If the price of one good increases relative to another, and if resources are interchangeable, so that means they can, can be put to various uses, and this will lead to a price signal sent by consumers to businesses to reallocate their resources. And thirdly, this would mean the allocation of resources away from one unprofitable good or service to the profitable good or service. And so because demand determines um, the, the living standards or how, how much we value a certain good or service, because the demand of a certain good has increased and because an increase in demand results in an increase in price, therefore producers would maximize profits by allocating their resources to this productive use. And so this, these three steps reflect how relative prices or changes in relative prices can send price signals to producers so that they allocate their resources to the most efficient or productive use.